going to deliver, hopefully not a baby, but I will deliver a senior lecture. And um, now that Dr. Schechter has left the building, I believe, um, what you don't know is that he totally had an ulterior motive for his lecture. Basically, he showed that five-minute delivery to prevent any resident from ever going on maternity leave ever again. And from watching that, I'm pretty certain that he's succeeded. So good job, Dr. Schechter. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's get going. Oh, you just missed your shout out, Dr. Schechter. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I would like to dedicate my senior lecture to all of these fools, the class of 2016. I have relied on you guys every single day. Uh, we needed you, and we needed each other, and I'm so, so grateful for you, especially you, Alex Rebel. Um, I am also grateful that we were able to go through this experience together, and I hope that also shows the PG 1, 2, and 3 classes how important it really is to lean on each other, and if you're not doing it now, today is the day to have your first lean. Uh, next, next, next thing I'd like to share is my only financial disclosure is that for the next two to five to eight to hopefully not ten years, I'm going to focus on aggressively paying down my debt as well. And uh, the reason I wrote that is, you know those things that wake you up in the middle of the night, the things, the first thing that uh, rushes into your mind first thing in the morning? And it sort of evolved over four years. When I was a PGY2 turning into a PGY3, I used to think, oh my god, this is CCT, I'm really excited, but what's going to happen? And sort of towards the end of residency, different things are waking me up in the middle of the night. Um, for example, I'm starting to wake up with the fear of God that like now's the time to get going on this. And y'all should think about that too. And the final disclaimer before we get going in today's real senior lecture is that if you're waiting for a giant golden nugget of medical knowledge to drop out of my face in the next 20 minutes, it's not going to happen. The goal of this lecture is for you to sit back, but be engaged, relax a little bit, and hopefully look for some tips and a little inspiration. So this story starts back almost exactly four years ago today. I was uh, in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, foreign medical graduate, waiting to graduate. I had like a few days to graduate. I was tanning a lot, going to the beach a lot. And I got this email from Stephanie Lane. Uh, I open it up and there's my contract. And she writes, uh, please print this out, sign it, and send it back to me as soon as possible. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I just got, I landed my dream job. Somebody believed in me. Somebody thought that I could become an emergency physician. So I signed it, scanned it, faxed it right back, or uh, emailed it right back to Stephanie Lane. I didn't even read it. Did anybody read their contract? So the day I signed that contract, and the day that everybody else signed their contracts as well, our lives completely changed. And whether you knew it or not, the day you signed that contract, we all became teachers. Straight up. The day we became residents was the day that we became teachers. So that being said, then why, <clears throat> when these handsome fellows walk down the hallway towards you in the A-pod, do you automatically feel this? <laughs> so the objectives for today's uh, discussion, I, I don't want to call it a lecture, I want to call it more of a discussion, is our, we're, first we're going to make it rain, because who doesn't want to make it rain? Then we're going to talk about our feelings, because I love feelings. I'm going to throw down some uh, medical education literature published about what our learners want from us. We'll learn a few tricks, maybe we'll get a chance to practice, but more than anything, I want people to go home feeling hopeful and feeling happy and feeling inspired. So, onward. This is a funny little activity. Um, it's something that helps us all come into this moment. Chief residents, you guys were my guinea pig group when I tried this at a previous lecture, and I hope you're willing to participate. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and gather each other in a, in a very safe space, <laughs> and we're gonna invite, I'm gonna invite you 
to all be very open and present. So if you are sitting in the row from Helen and back, by the way, thanks so much for coming. I'm so psyched that you come to us. I don't see you all the time. You're amazing. Um, from Helen and back, you guys are going to be the pitter-patter of the ring. So when I put my hands up like this, I want you to patter a little bit louder. When I go like this, pitter-patter a little softer. And when I go like this, it means stop. Okay, Pitter Patterers. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> what? I feel like I'm on. I feel like that. From Dr. Wolfram to this side of the room, you guys are going to be the rustling of the wind. <laughs> <laughs> and from Dr. Bloomberg to this side of the room, what I'd like for you to be is a little so tinkling snaps of the rain. A little drop of the Okay. So, with all of us combined in this room, what we're going to do is we're going to make it rain. And after we've make, made it rain, after we've stopped, I want you to close your eyes, take one deep breath in, let one deep breath go, and just be present in the class. Ready? So let's go. Let's go, Rain. <laughs> So overwhelmingly, 
we're seeing CCT. A little eight pod, a few little eight pods in there. And UHB, I'm biased, we got nothing to offer. And a very little bit of peace. Oh, and there it is. That's my <laughs> Where is your least favorite place to teach and why? So this is one is a response, text the place, and then a quick answer why. I hate it. I'm too hungry to teach. Or whatever you feel. I don't want to bias your decisions. Or where that might be. UHB, <laughs> it's a shit show. Thank you for your honesty. Bring it. This is, this is, this is why our cell phone responded. A pod, too busy. Oh, hey. Mad Mattering, son. UHP, too busy. A pod, too busy. <clears throat> Peace, they scare me. A hole is the worst. No space. UHP, it's gross. Pod <laughs> A, I can't get my notes done. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for bringing it and being present. And one of the things that I, I like about this is that I'm sure that many of us have had the same questions, had the same complaints, and don't feel like there's uh, your responses or your attitudes will be welcome in the public domain. So thank you. That was actually extremely helpful. Do you anticipate that in your first job, you are going to be teaching somebody, either mid-levels, residents, medical students, etc.? Okay. So what have we learned? Some of us like teaching more than others. Some of us like teaching okay, but only in certain circumstances. Some of us want some more information, but most of us feel like we will be doing bedside teaching in the future. So there's, there's, there's some conflict there, but that's good. I love a little conflict. Sometimes I like a lot of conflict. <laughs> Sometimes a conflict just finds me. All right. Okay, so some people are either checked out, not interested, it's not gonna be part of their life, they're not interested. Um, everybody else, might want a little bit more instruction or some tips and tools to be a good bedside teacher. Um, okay, okay. Let's go back to the point of power. All right. Thank you for sharing your attitudes. Uh, I really appreciate the honesty. Thanks so much. So now that we've used our cell phones, now it's time to bring draw you guys back up to the screen. All right. And we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about some medical education research. Um, that actually tells us what EM learners want. So uh, in Academic Emergency Medicine in 2006, uh, this uh, sort of descriptive study was published. It's out of the University of Toronto, and what they did is they performed a focus group. There were 28 EM learners broken down into groups of three, four, or five, and they came from all different areas, much like us. There's two routes to uh, EM board certification in Canada, so both the through family practice and the categoricals. Um, they included rotating residents as well as medical students. And what they did is they sat them down, they recorded their conversations about their experience uh, rotating through the various emergency departments in Toronto. And they recorded or they ticked off a little box every time or noted every single time a certain theme was brought up or certain words were said. And they gathered all that, and they divided it into 14 major themes. And overwhelmingly, the most important thing for our EM learners is that they want us to have a positive attitude. So that was the broad, uh, the broad category, but when you took the subgroups from positive attitude, it was they used teachable moments that the that the, uh, the teacher was attentive to the learner, enthusiastic, communicated well, had a great sense of humor, they were open to questions, and they gave good and timely feedback. So, uh, the, sorry, not the feedback, but the other results that were sort of less important than the 
the positive attitude is that the teacher used teachable moments and they took time. So what does that tell you? Our, our students don't care if we've published the most recent paper. They don't care about our RVUs. They certainly don't care how many patients we see per hour because that doesn't even register on their radar. They just want us to be positive and supportive. That's it. If you take one thing out of today's inspirational discussion, it's be positive, <laughs> supportive, and make the student feel like you're taking time to teach. Don't actually take the time, no. <laughs> All right. So, onward, pimping. We talk about it a lot. We heard a bit about it a lot in medical school. Does it help? So this guy, Alan Detsky, he's the chair, vice dean, chair of medicine at the University of Toronto. He's a really weird guy, but he's a genius. Anyway, the thing about pimping is that it's here. It's been here for a while. It lends, it, it, what it is is sort of like a derogatory term for the Socratic teaching method, which for those of us who are sort of confused by this, we've heard the, heard the word bounced around over and over. What it means is, guiding the learner to discovery through progressive questioning. And we all think of it as just getting nailed to the wall and shamed by our uh, senior residents on our surgery rotation. Can we just state how terrible of a term it yeah. is, though? It's it's true. Terrible. Like, I, I just find it personally offensive. I'm not a prostitute, and I don't like be, you know, like, mm -hmm. I just don't like it. You're right. Yeah. And, but it is, it's a colloquialism. I, I appreciate you saying that. Thanks, Melanie. It's a colloquialism for the Socratic teaching method, which is probing the learner by asking them questions. Um, so, this article, it's hilarious. If anybody wants it, I'll send it to you. And it's, and it's basically, it sort of describes characteristics, I'm sorry, of the pimper and the pimpy, and strategies that you use to avoid being de demolished by your teacher. So, what is constructive about it? Asking questions is actually a really effective way of teaching or guiding your learner down the same mental path that you want them to go down. So the Socratic teaching method is old. It's not going away, but there are rules. There's just one rule up there. But when you think of, stop for a second when you're asking a medical student a question or a junior resident or a rotator, what is your motivation? If you're trying to inspire, educate, leave a lasting impression, or drop an important learning point, go ahead, lead with those questions. If you're trying to support, uh, show your superior intellect, your experience by humiliating your learner or belittling them, turn it off. Nothing can possibly good can come from shaming your student. Absolutely nothing. Rule number one. So, do we question people to the point of tears? Or do we actually, how do we use this to our benefit? Anybody have an idea how we could use questioning to guide our learner to the point that we want to make. <coughs> I think sometimes it, it can be an opportunity for the learner to show what they know. So a lot of times, you're, if you don't use Socratic method, you're telling, telling them the right thing or the learning point, but sometimes it gives the learner an opportunity to show like, hey, I knew some of this, and you can build upon that and maybe do a more advanced learning point rather than just focusing on that. Great, so it could also act as sort of like a needs assessment or a sort of level gauge of where your student is at. That's a great idea. And it can also act as a way for you to help walk them through how to think about the situation, like what questions should they be asking in their head and answering to get to the conclusion along the way, what information should they be putting So uh, Dr. Ferrari brought up a great point, and and it lends itself well to emergency medicine. Oftentimes, we don't get to a diagnosis. In fact, I, I would say that we seldomly get to a diagnosis. But what we need to do is teach our learners to think about all the things that we need to think about 
to exclude our more serious diagnoses. And that's sort of, you can guide them there by asking questions. Dr. Nett. I think for me, the Socratic method, whenever it's applied to me by somebody who knows more, whenever I try to apply it to med student, um, what it actually does is creates an active learner. I am actively trying to think about what the attending is trying to get me to think about. And, and I think if you pose a question to someone who knows less than you, that should be your right to, to get them to walk over from where they are and yes, show what they learn, but also kind of get them to bridge the gap from where they are to where you are in an active fashion. Great. So Dr. Hernandez brings up an amazing point. By asking a question, by throwing out a question, you've engaged your learner. You're not throwing knowledge into their face that's just gonna bounce off over their head, when's lunch, oh my God, is this gonna be on my shelf? You're actually <laughs> engaging the learner. Grandman, last one point? I was gonna say, it must be helpful for getting people to think under stress and in a high response. No matter what the room is like, when you ask somebody a question, you can see them get a little nervous and getting used to being able to respond and think through things when your heart rate's up is quite useful. So that's very interesting. That's like when you're sleeping at night and someone wakes up and says, the plane's crashing, the plane's crashing, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? It can be very stressful. So like, <laughs> I have two brothers. Um, so, so what Nico is bringing up is very interesting. You know, having the learner Think in the moment. I think that's a very, very delicate line to tread. On one 